Okay, well, I guess we'll go ahead and get started. I was listening to uh, Peter Klein uh, doing his talk, I believe that was yesterday, and, and he uh, had the unenviable position of standing between students and lunchtime. And at least I don't have that position, but I do have you right after lunch, which means you're all drowsy and you're thinking about your, I don't know, digestion or something instead of thinking about anything of intellectual value. But uh, I don't know that there is a real optimum time for students to uh, sit in a classroom. Early in the morning, they haven't had their coffee. They're still waking up. And late in the afternoon, they've got other things to do. I think there's always an excuse for any time period. So I'll try to keep this interesting, but... Um, I, uh, I've taught uh, at the college level for, I guess now, 14, 15 years, something like that. I started when I was a graduate student here at Auburn, um, went through the Mises program, went through Mises University, just as you're doing here, and uh, I can tell you it made a big impact on me and has been, um, ever since then, uh, something that I've looked back on as a as a way for me to pick up on some things I would not have picked up on the, in the classroom um, myself. So I think you're definitely doing the right thing uh, being here, uh, going through these um, classes this week. I know that as Professor Hoppe mentioned on the first, no, I believe it was Mark Thornton mentioned on the first night, you have to explain what you're doing this week to your friends and family They probably will not understand why you would choose to do something like this, but um, I'm sure by this point in the week you recognize the value. I, I have always been interested in environmental issues, and that's one of the areas in which I worked when I was in graduate school. In fact, my dissertation was on environmental regulation. And I think that if we can tackle this and understand it from an Austrian perspective, then we'll be able to uh, answer some of the toughest challenges that uh, are presented to uh, free market advocates. Um, it's, it's, a, if it, it's a difficult set of issues, I think, but it really boils down to uh, two basic subsets of issues. One is environmental resource use. How are we going to use uh, trees and fisheries and uh, coal deposits and oil deposits and that kind of thing. And then uh, also externalities, what's commonly called externalities, or spillover effects, what happens when you uh, engage in some kind of consumption or production activity and that has a side effect that you may not have intended on a bystander. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on the environmental resource use issues here uh, although that is interesting, and I think that there's a lot to be said for our understanding of how markets can handle resource questions. But you see a lot of the discussion of this, and I'd encourage you to look into this further. I mean, for example, we have the current uh, 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 proposal to ban uh, compact, or sorry, ban incandescent light bulbs and uh, more or less force people to use these uh, little spirally uh, compact fluorescent light bulbs or LED light bulbs or whatever. I was in Lowe's the other day and was shocked at the price of some of these things, but apparently our intellectual betters in Washington know better what kind of light bulb we should be using and that we should front load the cost of our uh, lighting. Um, there, that, that's basically a, a resource use question. How much energy should be used? And of course, when regulation enters into that picture, uh, they're doing, making these decisions without any appeal to prices or, or the vital information that prices provide. Or we could talk about deforestation and the concern that people have about chopping down all the trees in the forest. I have students who will tell me that uh, they, they, um, we, we, should, we should go green. We should uh, use fewer, uh, use less paper, recycle the paper that we do use, print on both sides, and that kind of thing. And uh, I say, well, why would you want to do that? I thought you liked trees. And I get this kind of, I, I say, well, I, I, and I print out my tests on uh, lots of paper and, and uh, hand out lots of blue books for these students to write their essays in and use up lots of paper. And I always tell them, I, I'm, I'm handing you lots and lots of paper 
so that the tree farmers will plant more trees. And of course, if you recycle your paper, then that's slightly reducing the demand for virgin timber, which means that farmers will go plant something else besides trees. Uh, so I really don't understand some of this. Um, I guess where some of this is coming from. Um, if you want more trees in the ground, then it would make more sense to uh, use trees so that farmers have an incentive to plant more of them. But um, I, I always get the slightly uh, stunned look when I bring this up that recycling is actually going to re result in fewer trees. Uh, or we could talk about endangered species, and that's really another resource use question. Uh, what happens to uh, endangered species? Well, it looks like the Endangered Species Act has not helped. Uh, species that land on that list tend to stay on that list. They don't seem to have a whole lot of success at getting off the list. And um, a lot of that is because uh, once a species is on the endangered species list, it's uh, forbidden to own the property. And of course, we know that a lot of the property or a lot of the resource use problems result from an absence of property rights. Um, there's a tragedy of the commons problem that we, we might mention later. Uh, once something is, is removed from the private sector and, and the private property rights are, are eliminated, then uh, very few people have an incentive to conserve the resource. Uh, and of course, the uh, uh, law that regulation that dates back to the 1970s on fuel economy, and every so often you'll see Congress debating again whether or not to raise the corporate average fuel economy uh, limits. And um, we, we might talk about that a little bit later if we have time. Uh, basically, that has resulted in um, hundreds of thousands of deaths and injuries, if not millions of deaths and injuries, since the institution of that law, uh, simply because that in incentivizes automakers to make cars lighter than they otherwise would. So we end up with cars that may get better gas mileage, but they get very bad human mileage. That is, you consume a lot of human lives driving on the road even while you're consuming less gas. And uh, so that, those are all valuable and I think important considerations. But what I'd like to spend more time on here is understanding the role of the state, which is key to both of these issues, in, in uh, dealing mainly with problems of uh, side effects, pollution, and so forth. Governments suffer from basically two problems, two key problems. There are others, I, I, I suppose, but uh, one is the socialist calculation problem. Uh, one of the lectures here earlier this week mentioned uh, Mises' 1920 article on economic calculation in the socialist commonwealth, and that's where he lays out this argument that socialist economies cannot calculate, they cannot decide how to use resources, how much, in what quantities, what production processes to use, and with the absence of price information, that uh, that calculation is is uh, impossible. The other problem is what I would call incentive incompatibility, or you might hear this referred to in a classroom in some contexts as a principal agent problem. That is, it, if you send these people off to uh, your state capital or national capital or wherever that you, you expect them, uh, in some sort of wildly optimistic uh, uh, frame of mind to, to do something on your behalf, uh, the uh, uh, politician or bureaucrat, uh, anybody else working in, in government, has not dispensed with uh, his incentive to do things that benefit himself as a person. And uh, so we, we have individuals who are in office basically for themselves, and um, they tend to do things that get them reelected or get them some sort of appointment to a board of directors or get you know, Johnny Jr. Senator into law school or enhance their law practice or whatever it is that they would like to do for themselves. And uh, it, it seems that this approach to understanding political behavior explains a lot more of the laws and regulations that we have to live under. Um, some of the thinking on environmental issues assumes that politicians and bureaucrats are directing their efforts to do something for the environment. And I think this is a, a problem. Uh, economists have shown that a lot of economic, or sorry, environmental intervention can be explained a lot better if you simply assume 
that these people are not disinterested philosopher kings. They, are, they have campaigns to fund, children to send to college, careers to further, and, and other things. One example I like to use of this is um, uh, a, a regulation that appeared in 1976 called the Resource Conservation and Recovery Act. And what this regulation did is uh, essentially require firms that created hazardous waste to dispose of this waste through incineration. And uh, the incineration industry grew largely as a result of this particular law in 1976. Well, basically what they do is they take hazardous waste, a lot of which is flammable, um, petroleum derivatives and that kind of thing, uh, paint thinners and that, that sort. And, and they'll subject this stuff to very, very high temperatures and uh, break it down chemically so that it's some sort of inert ash or uh, gas or something that's less harmful than the original material. That's basically the idea. Well, it turns out that the, um, the cement industry, which also uses very high temperatures to uh, create cement, um, they found that, that since they already had these very high temperature ovens, they could simply uh, pipe in some of this hazardous waste and uh, incinerate it along with their, their production process and do so at a much lower cost than the incinerator industry. And the incinerator industry, um, at the time I was looking at this, um, uh, was, was charging a price that was almost three times the price that a cement kiln would charge for uh, essentially doing the same thing. And so the cement kilns began to run the incinerators out of business and they had captured over 60% of the industry, uh, in, in, incinerator industry's market um, by the early 90s. And here on the slides, I've got a picture of a cement kiln. The yellow pipe that you see there is uh, piping in some hazardous waste in the cement kiln. And on the left, you see, I'm from South Carolina. Um, we've got cement kilns there, as both states do. And that's one in Holly Hill, South Carolina. And, um, uh, these, these cement kilns are making a pile of money on this kind of side business of uh, burning hazardous waste. Well, what the, uh, what the uh, uh, incinerator industry decided to do was not innovate to reduce their costs or um, go quietly out of business because of this process of creative destruction that Joseph uh, Schumpeter mentioned, but they, they decided to fight this by using the state, the coercive hand of the state. So they decided what they would do is they would launch a series of lawsuits against cement kilns, complaining that cement kilns were polluting the environment by burning hazardous waste and try to get them uh, shut down. And they did not do this directly, but they ended up doing this more or less under the table by funding supposedly grassroots citizens organizations, giving them money to go off and sue these uh, cement kilns as if they were some sort of uh, concerned, uh, concerned uh, citizen group. Well, that, that's political behavior for you. That's political behavior that is aimed at reducing competition rather than doing something that was beneficial to the environment. There's, uh, there was not a lot of evidence that cement kilns were any worse for the environment than uh, the incinerators were. Uh, in fact, uh, I don't often quote from people from the Sierra Club, but here's uh, Blakeman Early who uh, was from the Sierra Club and argued that the commercial waste industry had an in interest in improving, they call it improvement, uh, but improving regulations sufficiently to drive mom and pop operations out of business. In other words, reduce competition. Now where I'd like to spend most of my time is um, an article, a, really, a fairly lengthy article by Murray Rothbard called Law, Property Rights, and Air Pollution. And this is where you start to see the real distinctives of the Austrian approach to environmental issues. It's a very long article, which is only fair because uh, Ronald Coase's article from 1960, which is uh, the, uh, I think, at least it used to be the most cited article within economics, and uh, uh, it was 44 pages, which was considered to be quite long for an article. Most of that's historical cases and so forth. But I'd like for you to understand why it is that, that, that Austrians tend to think differently about environmental issues. The Austrian libertarian approach to environmental problems is based on a tort law approach. 
That is, if someone aggresses against another person by invading their property or affecting their, their person with pollution, then they can be held strictly liable in a court and required to stop. So what is a tort? Other than a nice little dessert thing, um, this is tort without the E. And uh, in the law of torts, uh, a harm to another individual is understood as a physical invasion of a person or property. And as we'll see a little bit later, we'll, we'll talk about this in a little bit more detail, uh, uh, tort law requires the threat or the invasion to be, the, to be near and imminent, to be personal, to, to affect a particular person not some sort of, uh, well, I felt bad as I drove over the bridge, over the creek, because I knew that the plant five miles upstream had dumped something I don't really know much about into the stream, and I, my knowledge of this, uh, this chemical in the water made me feel bad, and therefore I'm suing. Well, under the traditional understanding of, of how to bring a lawsuit or what, what the rules are of standing to sue, that's not typically permitted. Um, I'd be happy to talk about standing later if I had more time, but I think I'll pass on that now. Um, the Cosian approach, if I can get my slide to change. There we go, there's Cos, uh, who is, by the way, 100 years old now. Um, seems like economics is the field you want to go into if you want to live a very, very long time. Hayek, Mises, you know, people, tend to live a long time in economics for some reason, especially if you win the Nobel Prize, as Coase did. Um, and uh, the Coase is, is known for several things. He did some work on, um, uh, he's famous for an FTC paper that he did before this 1960 paper that I'm gonna talk about here. And uh, uh, Dr. Klein mentioned Coase, not unfavorably in that other context, but. Austrians don't think so highly of Coase when it comes to environmental issues or the Coase theorem. The Coase theorem basically says that in the absence of transaction costs, the outcome in context of pollution is to be the amount, the amount of pollution. The outcome will be the same regardless of the in, initial assignment of property rights. Now, it, I'll take a minute to try to explain why that why that is said to be so, but we all know, and Coase knew, that in fact uh, transaction costs aren't zero. Uh, so courts would have to, under his thinking, would have to balance costs and benefits to both sides and make a determination of what was the appropriate uh, use of the resources, who should have the right to pollute. Uh, sometimes people make the mistake of saying, well, in a Coasean world, transaction costs are zero. Well, no, Coase didn't say that transaction costs were, in fact, zero. He said if they were, then these things would happen. So um, i get my slide to change again. It's not changing. Why is that? There we go. Okay. This is Harold Dimsetz. Um, if you're... Um, not already overburdened with reading from this week, um, there's a very interesting exchange between Walter Block and Harold Emsetz that appeared in the Review of Austrian Economics some years ago. And I believe uh, one or two um, elements of that exchange occurred elsewhere, but that, that's, a, that's a good exchange to look at. Uh, Demsetz was defending the Kosian approach, Block was defending the Austrian approach, of course, and he was saying, or Demsetz was, or sorry, Block was saying that the Coasean approach is neglecting the, the problem of the subjectivity of costs and of benefits. Um, Coase and Demsetz have, have asserted that um, it doesn't make any difference how property rights are allocated in cases of conflicting interests, provided the property rights are assigned to someone and then defended. So they would, 
they would say, well, the, pro the basic problem is that property rights don't belong to anybody in particular, and so there's this, this uh, problem of pollution that will exist until property rights are assigned to somebody. And the main problem is that the courts need to make these property rights determinations. Well, there's a problem with this, several. Coase, in his article, which if you haven't read, I would encourage you to read, it is 44 pages. Just promise me that if you read the Coase article, you'll also read the Rothbard article, uh, Law, Property Rights, and Air Pollution. Um, the, the Coase um, article goes through a number of cases where there was some kind of dispute over property rights. A brewery that's got vapors that are flowing into somebody else's building, or uh, one of the best examples was, uh, or fam most famous examples was a railroad back in the days of coal-fired locomotives that was spewing embers onto someone's field, burning the field, and uh, then whose fault is this? Is it the fault of the farmer for planting crops too close to the tracks, or is it the fault of the railroad for spewing embers? And uh, of course, this goes to court, and uh, we have this sort of Coasean argument that if, if there are zero transaction costs, or at least very low transaction costs, then the farmer and the railroad could come to some sort of agreement after the court makes its decision. So let's think about this a little more carefully here. Let's suppose you've got a, I'll use an orchard because uh, Block in his uh, exchange with dim sets mentions uh, what he called Austrian pure snow trees, if I remember correctly. And so let's suppose we have this grove of trees or an orchard and the uh, orchard is being damaged by this passing railroad back in the days of coal-fired locomotives and this embers are falling on the orchard burning the orchard, damaging the orchard, and the farmer, the orchard grower, uh, complains, takes the uh, railroad to court and says, look, you're, you're burning my trees, and the court then says, well, we're going to have to assign the property rights to somebody. Either we're going to assign the property rights to the railroad and allow them to continue to spew their embers, and you're just going to have to do something, build a wall or move your trees or something to get the trees out of the way of the embers. Or we're going to assign the property rights to the orchard grower and say that the orchard grower has the right to be ember free and the railroad then has to stop. Well, let's suppose the court looks at the market value of the orchard. And the orchards, and the court says, uh, well, looks like the uh, orchard's worth about $60,000. And let's suppose the railroad would have to incur a cost of $80,000 to install some sort of device on its trains to prevent sparks from flying out from the trains. So the Court, let's say, gives the rights to the farmer. Well, the farmer's very happy, and the railroad then has to incur this $80,000 cost to install this device to prevent sparks. Now, the railroad might come back to the farmer and say, look, it's going to cost us $80,000 to deal with your, the sparks. To, uh, now, you won the case. We don't want to have to spend this $80,000, though. Would you take some kind of payment in exchange for putting up with our sparks. And the railroad may, uh, may be able to entice the farmer with some sort of payment. Say the, the farmer says, well, yeah, if you pay me $60,000, then that'll satisfy me and I, you can go ahead and throw your sparks. The railroad would rather pay $60,000 than pay $80,000. So the farmer gets paid off and the sparks continue to fly. Well. Suppose the court case goes the other way, the railroad wins, and so now the, uh, the farmer says, oh, well, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm at a loss here. I, maybe I can afford to pay the railroad, even though the railroad won, maybe I can pay the railroad to stop their sparks. And so the farmer thinks, well, how much is the damage to me from having my orchard burnt? However much that damage is, 
that's the limit that I would pay the railroad to stop. And Coase would say, well, if the farmer's field is valued at, or orchard is valued at uh, $60,000, the farmer would go to the railroad and say, well, will you accept a payment of, say, $59,900 to stop your sparks? And the railroad, of course, would say, well, no, because it would cost us $80,000 to stop our sparks. So $59,900 is not going to be enough. And so Coase is pointing out that in either case, whether the farmer wins or the railroad wins, the sparks continue to fly because in the Coasean view, that's the most efficient outcome. That's the lowest cost outcome. Now, maybe you caught the problem with this. I mentioned something a few minutes ago, and maybe you caught it. I hope so. After a few days here, maybe you've done some reading on this. Not the transaction cost. It's the subjective cost. Remember I said that the courts look at the farmer's orchard. And the farmer's orchard is valued by the courts at $60,000. The court says, well, comparable orchards in your area, or we'll do a little appraisal here, worth about $60,000. If you were to sell your orchard on the open market, it would bring about $60,000. So the court will then say, and we're assuming the court is trying to do the right thing, which I said earlier is not necessarily a good assumption. But let's suppose the court's trying to do the right thing. So they say $60,000 is the market value. For most of us, the market value of our assets is less than the value to us of those same assets. How do I know? Otherwise, we would put them up for market, up to the market. We'd try to sell them. The minute my house becomes less valuable to me than it is to the rest of the market, assuming low transaction costs, then I will sell it. The fact is that my house is worth more to me than the rest of the market, therefore I keep my house. Now, of course, transaction costs can be a problem, but Suppose the orchard is sacred to the farmer. Now that may sound a little silly, I don't know. I don't know a whole lot of people who worship trees, but it's the point is that you could have a value to you, a subjective value that is considerably higher than the value to the rest of the market. It may be that the farmer thinks, well, if I allow one of these trees to perish, I will spend an eternity in torment as a consequence. Now we may say, well, I don't believe that. That's not, you know, why would any court accept that as an explanation of the value of the orchard? And why? It doesn't matter. Farmer has a value on that orchard that could be very much higher than the $60,000 to the market. Let's say it's a million dollars. For a million dollars, he will suffer whatever divine consequences accrue to the cutting down of the trees, or the burning of the trees by the railroad. So now the court comes to the farmer and they say, well, look, we're going to rule on the railroad's behalf. I'm sorry, but your, your, your uh, railroad made a good case or whatever, and so uh, now we have the farmer goes to the railroad and says, look, I, please stop throwing sparks in my orchard. The railroad says, well, look, it's going to cost us $80,000 to, to stop. What have you got to offer us? The farmer says, well, look, I can't sell it because it's only worth $60,000 to other people, but it's worth a million dollars to me. Your $80,000 cost of um, mitigating your sparks is nothing compared to my million dollar loss if you continue to throw them. And the railroad says, well, okay, but that's not sufficient to induce us to do what, we, what you want us to do. So this is the problem. A problem. I say it's a problem because in this case it's produced this massive inefficiency. It's causing the farmer to lose a million dollars while the railroad saves 80,000. So there's an efficiency problem here, but there's another problem beyond this. It's an ethics problem. 
One of the problems, and this is key, the Coast Demsets approach, by pretending to be value free, is in fact importing an ethical norm of efficiency. They're asserting that property rights should be assigned on the basis of this efficiency, but even if this concept of social efficiency were meaningful, they don't answer the questions of why efficiency, efficiency should be the overriding consideration in establishing legal principles, or why externalities, externalities should be internalized above all other considerations. Now, we're in the realm of these unexamined ethical questions. Why is it that the right of the farmer to homestead a piece of acreage and keep it from intrusion by others is now tossed out in favor of efficiency? Now, that is an ethical question. What right do the courts have to ignore such questions? Yes, this is normative, but it's no less important. Efficiency implies a goal. A car that is efficient might be fuel efficient, or it might be efficient in the use of the materials used to manufacture it, or efficient in some other way. But what's the goal here? Is it lower dollar cost? Is it liberty? Is it the efficient use of some other resource? Rothbard said, we cannot decide on public policy, tort law, rights or liabilities on the basis of efficiencies or minimizing of costs. This is in a chapter out of Marty Rizzo's book, Time, Uncertainty, and Disequilibrium. He said, economists will have to get used to the idea that not all of life can be encompassed by our own discipline. A painful lesson, no doubt, but compensated by the knowledge that it may be good for our souls to realize our own limits, and just perhaps to learn about ethics and about justice. You may, have, uh, remember, you may remember from uh, the talk just before lunch by Gary North, he's made reference to the fundamental problem in our human hearts. Okay, that's, well, now we're starting to talk about things outside of our discipline, but do not make the mistake of thinking that economics can explain everything. It cannot. Well, one of the arguments against Rothbard's position, against what I would call the Austrian position, is that over the years, common law judges will always arrive at the socially efficient allocation of property rights and tort liabilities. So we get this kind of evolution of the common law toward something that is efficient. Well, <clears throat> Rothbard responds by saying that law is in fact normative. He says, whatever positive or customary law has emerged cannot simply be recorded and blindly followed. All such law must be subject to a thorough critique grounded on such principles. So if there are discrepancies between the actual law as it has emerged through the common law process, if there are con a contrast between that and principles of justice, as there almost always are, then it would be wise to take steps to make the actual law conform to the just principles. Now, in contrast to the Kosian approach, which basically says it doesn't matter if you, your family has held this property for five generations, or you arrived on this unclaimed property many years ago, you staked it out, you farmed it, you built a house, you buried your family members on it when they died, and you lived here for five generations. And the Kosian approach would say, well, so? not necessarily efficient for you to continue to stay there. Why should any of that matter? Well, Rothbard would say, we need to allow people to homestead unclaimed property. And beyond the 
obvious homesteading of taking a piece of property and blending your labor with it in that Lockean sense and uh, working land, making it yours by that process. Homesteading can be interpreted much in a much broader sense than this. This could include homesteading a certain level of environmental cleanliness or dirtiness, if you prefer to look at it that way. So if another party alters that level of environmental cleanliness without permission, then the property owner can sue for cessation of that intrusion. So Rothbard would say that no action should be considered illicit or illegal unless it invades or aggresses against the person or just property of another. And that includes particles that float over your property into your airspace, noxious vapors or something that would affect your ability to enjoy your property. Now let's be clear here because there's a lot of confusion on this. If something happens as a result of another person's actions that reduces the market value of your property, this is not the same category of behavior. This is not an invasion. People talk about this often in reference to, say, Walmart. Well, Walmart appeared in the neighborhood and the property value of the hardware store and the local grocery store and whatever else fell because Walmart arrived. Now, you're in school and you're learning about externalities and so forth, they'll call this a pecuniary externality. The value of your property fell as a result of somebody else's actions. The Walmart appears, or the Home Depot appears, or whatever, and as a result, your property is now less valuable. That is not an invasion. You do not have title to other people's minds. You do not have title to the valuations that other people put on your products. So if a Walmart appears in my neighborhood and reduces the value of my store because the customers that I might have thought of as my customers, they're not really my customers, if those customers decide that Walmart's offering something that they prefer better than what I am offering, then they are perfectly free to do that. I did not own my customers. I did not own their minds or their valuations or their continued business. And when people say that Walmart forced another business to close or shut down somebody else's uh, livelihood, Walmart did not do that. Walmart simply offered people something that they preferred better. The customers shut down the local hardware store, if in fact that's happening. And of course, there's a big debate about whether in fact these are cases made up by labor unions who have it out for Walmart or what. But if that in fact is happening, and I'm, I'm temporarily granting this, that as a result of Walmart's appearing, some other stores are shutting down. This process of creative destruction is inherent to the market process and does not constitute some sort of intrusion on somebody else's property. No one has the right to protect the value of their property because the value is simply the reflection of what people are willing to pay for it. Nobody has a right to their customers. Walmart has done nothing ethically wrong from the libertarian perspective in opening a store. Well, libertarian theory adopts a strict liability approach. <coughs> says that even if you did not intend to hurt somebody else, and I mean a real, a, a, a direct action of yours that uh, trespasses on somebody else's property and harms that other person, Even if you did not intend to harm that other person, you are strictly liable. So 
for example, if Jones assaults and attacks Smith, and Smith then in self-defense pulls out a gun and shoots Jones, or tries to shoot Jones, but in fact the shot goes wild and accidentally hits a bystander named Brown, should Smith be liable for the injury to Brown? Well, under the libertarian approach, most definitely. And one way to look at this is to say, well, what if Brown could have foreseen this, this accidental shooting and in his own self-defense, pulled out a gun and shot, uh, I'm losing track, Smith, <laughs> to prevent Smith from shooting him. Would that be permissible? Well, of course. Everybody has a right to self-defense, not just Smith. Not just the person who accidentally shot somebody else. Unfortunately, the courts do not hold that doctrine. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that um, here, but I'll basically say that, that anyone has the right to defend their property, according to Rothbard, against an overt act initiated against it. We can take this into the realm of property crimes. A victim, according to Rothbard, should be entitled to use any force, including deadly force, to defend or recover his property so long as the crime is in the process of commission. That is, until the criminal is apprehended and duly tried by legal process. In other words, you should be able to shoot looters. Now, you may say, well, that, that, that's, that's not very nice. Uh, and it also makes it risky for potential victims because you can't say, well, that person was about to do something to me, so I shot him. Well, you have to wait until the crime's in the process of commission. You can't just preemptively strike. Well, that person was, was making an ugly face at me. I, you know, my kids do this all the time. He was making an ugly face at me. Well, I'm sorry. Um, but you can't preemptively do something to somebody because you think they're about to do something to you. And you think, that well, that makes it very risky, it makes life risky, because then you have to actually wait until something starts to happen before you can do anything about it. Well, it also makes life less risky in one other way, because as a, as a non-aggressor, you're more assured that no some excited alleged victim is going to pounce on you to... Uh, to perform some supposed act of self-defense. There's the burden of proof on the victim or a potential victim to show that there's been some kind of crime committed. Now, I, just to be clear, I'm speaking in terms of what the, the, um, the theory is on this, not how law actually is. So in, in any, any of this, I don't want you to go out and say, well, you know, Dr. Terrell said it was okay for me to do whatever, so um, uh, I'm, I'm not an attorney. I'm not giving legal advice. Please, please, please don't hurt somebody and say that I told you it was okay. <laughs> I, I'm embarrassed that I have to say this, you know, really. Um, you also have to establish, under this libertarian theory that I'm talking about here, you have to establish a burden of proof between the aggressor and the victim. And that connection has to be beyond a reasonable doubt. You have to, you have to show causality in the common sense concept of proof that A hit B. Not some probability, not some statistical correlation. You have to be able to show causality. Now, let's think about, think about homesteading and pollution. I mentioned earlier that homesteading can be seen much broader than simply plowing land and building a barn, digging a well, and calling that farmland yours. You can homestead a decibel level. According to Rothbard, you can say, well, you know, I built my house and there was an airport nearby and the airport was generating uh, occasional bursts of sound from the takeoff of airplanes and uh, under the uh, Rothbardian sense of, of homesteading, you wouldn't have any grounds to complain about the airport because the airport was there first. They homesteaded this right to continue to emit this volume of noise. 
Of course, if the tables were turned and I build a house and then an airport appears three miles away and airplanes are flying low over my house and creating all this kind of noise, then I would be able to sue the airport and say, well, look, I homesteaded peace and quiet. I never have had any noises on my property above X number of decibels until you appeared on the scene and started creating all this noise. Air pollution can be homesteaded. You can use air as a dumping ground for your pollutants. You can use air to breathe. You can use air for all kinds of things. And that use, if it's previously unclaimed, then becomes yours. There's a case here that I mentioned, um, which I believe is, is uh, referred to in the, in the Rothbard paper. Uh, Bove versus Donner Hanna Coke Company from 1932. Uh, actually, um, I want to say this is in the Coast paper. Um, in any case, it's, it's, a, it's a, a, a case where Coast and Rothbard come down two different sides of the issue completely. So it's a good example of what, how, how the Austrian approach to this differs. The plaintiff in this case had moved into an industrial region where the defendant was operating a Coke oven on the opposite side of the street. And I don't know if you, what you know about Coke ovens, but Coke ovens, especially in 1932, were not particularly pleasant places to, to be around. They emitted gases and noises and fumes and so forth. Well, the plaintiff then tried to go to court to enjoin the Coke oven out of existence, so the court then rejected the plea, and Rothbard would say, this is perfectly acceptable. This is the right thing the court should do. The court said, with all the dirt, smoke, and gas, which necessarily come from factory chimneys, trains, and boats, and with full knowledge that this region was especially adapted for industrial rather than residential purposes, and that factories would increase in the future, Plaintiff selected this locality as the site of her future home. She voluntarily moved into this district, fully aware of the fact that the atmosphere would constantly be contaminated by dirt, gas, and foul odors, and that she could not hope to find in this locality the pure air of a strictly residential zone. She evidently saw certain advantages in living in this congested center. This is not the case of an industry with its attendant noise and dirt, invading a quiet residential district. This is just the opposite. Here, a residence is built in an area naturally adapted for industrial purposes and already dedicated to that use. Plaintiff can hardly be heard to complain at this late date that her peace and comfort have been disturbed by a situation which existed, to some extent at least, at the very time she bought her property. And Rothbard would say, well, in that case, the court did the right thing. Trespass. Trespass is an invasion of the plaintiff's interest in the exclusive possession of his land. Nuisance is an interference with his use and enjoyment of it. The difference, Prosser says, is that between felling a tree across the boundary line and keeping the neighbor awake at night with the noise of a rolling mill. Well, Rothbard asks us to consider other ways in which a person's activity may emit something onto our property. And here he's saying we have to consider whether or not this invasion actually adversely affects the person whose property it is. He says, consider the case of radio waves. We're bombarded by radio waves all the time. These are invisible. I can't detect them. I don't feel worse because of them. Um, there are some people who will say, well, you know, if I live too close to a high voltage power line, it's going to cause some kind of health problem. But uh, it's difficult to establish that your cell phone or your Bluetooth or your Wi-Fi connection or whatever is going to cause me some sort of harm. We're all bombarded with these things all the time. Are they invasive? Should they be, th therefore be illegal? Simply because we can detect their passage through or, or around our bodies? Are we then to outlaw all kinds of radio emissions? 
Well, Rothbard says, no, of course not, because these boundary crossings don't interfere with anybody's exclusive possession or use or enjoyment of their property. I'm not hurt. They're invisible. Can't, can't detect these radio waves by my senses. We don't think they do any harm. I mean, I know there's this running debate about whether cell phones held close to your skull can cause some sort of damage over time, but I don't have neighbors walking up to me and holding their cell phone against my head. So I'm, not, I'm not, other than that possibility, I'm not really concerned about it. I don't have people beaming microwaves into my house. And just so Rothbard says that the, the proper distinction between trespass and nuisance, between strict liability per se and strict liability on the proof of harm, is not really based on whether you exclusively you possess this property but whether you can continue to use and enjoy it. So he says the proper distinction is between visible and tangible or sensible invasion of property, which interferes with your possession and use of it, versus the invisible, insensible boundary crossings that do not cause you any harm and therefore should not be outlawed unless new information comes out that they do in fact harm you. Uh, a related issue is, is um, whether, whether my property, my little quarter acre of land that my house sits on, whether I have those rights that extend up into outer space or down into the center of the earth. And of course, I have um, no ability, and Rothbard would say properly so, I have no ability to sue the airlines flying out of the airport five miles from my house for flying over my wedge of airspace. They're not reducing my enjoyment of the property, and even if they did, the airport was there before my house, and they've homesteaded that right to do that. So there's a difference between uh, use and enjoyment and some sort of absolute ownership. Now, what we have, in fact, is a legal system that's quite different. Um, let's talk a little bit about principles of liability. In order to be liable for pollution, the polluter would not have established some sort of homestead easement. The plaintiff must prove actual harm. Uh, now, if, if my neighbor is burning leaves in his backyard on a daily basis or something, and this is floating over to my house, and I'm coughing, and I can't see, and my eyes are watering, this, you know, I don't have to go prove that, that there's actual harm. That, that's, that's readily obvious. But the burden of proof does rest on the plaintiff. Fourth... <coughs> The plaintiff has to prove strict causality from the actions of the defendant to the victimization of the plaintiff. Again, it can't be that I, uh, I got sick and uh, you, um, you were driving back and forth in front of my house um, every day on your way to work, and so your air pollution from your car caused me to get sick, so I'm going to sue you. Like, you know, I can't do that. I've got to show strict causality. And this causality and aggression must be proved beyond a reasonable doubt. Finally, and this is somewhat more controversial because you see class action lawsuits all the time, there's no vicarious liability. There's only liability for people who actually commit the deed. Only the victim can press a lawsuit. Other people, like district attorneys, have no standing to sue. You have to show that you personally were harmed. Now, I did some work on this years ago where I showed that a lot of our environmental regulations, in fact, all of the major environmental statutes except for, I think, one or two, dispensed explicitly with the conventional law of standing. And they basically said, if you see that the law is violated, you can sue the company that's allegedly violating the law. You don't have to actually be harmed by this violation. You just have to see that it's violated. Uh, and so this made attorneys and uh, environmentalist groups piles and piles of money over the years because all they had to do is go through the public records of these firms, find where they were making some sort of paperwork violation, and they get the firm to pay up um, 
or, or settle with the EPA, and then the, the environmentalist group would often make uh, some money off of getting reimbursed for their attorney's fees. And we say, well, how can you get money off of being reimbursed? Well, the reimbursements were considerably higher than the uh, actual cost of some of these attorneys' fees. Uh, some of these attorneys were doing this more or less pro bono or, or, or at a low, low cost. To, to benefit these organizations, and so the organizations had a kind of money mill running for a while by uh, the fact that they did not have to show that they were personally harmed by these, uh, these violations. Rothbard would just say, <clears throat> look, every statute, every administrative rule is illegitimate and in itself invasive and a criminal interference with the property rights of non-criminals. Now, Rothbard's not one to mince words, but... <laughs> It, th this is this is the the, the view of of, uh, of regulation. You start taking away that the, the court based tort law approach and replacing it with a statute based approach, and you're going to run into all kinds of ethical problems. Any statute, any administrative regulation necessarily makes actions illegal that are not overt initiations of crimes or torts, according to libertarian theory. So this is why Rothbard is saying you can't make some sort of blanket pronouncement. Nobody can emit more than X amount of sulfur dioxide from their Coke oven because you haven't shown that that emission has damaged anybody. Now, if you can, then more power to you, but you cannot, you cannot impose a blanket regulation assuming damage without showing strict causality. Now, I only have about four or five minutes left. I don't want to run over time, but I, I did want to mention a couple of things. BP oil spill. I, I, this last year, you know, everybody was um, concerned about this and uh, a wide variety of opinions on what really happened uh, what the damage was, and so forth. Let's just look at this for a minute. I think it's interesting uh, uh, as, a, as a way of thinking about some of, these, um, some of these problems. Matthew Novak had an article that appeared in Mises Daily last year, which I would recommend, in which he said that the government specifically passed laws that gave the oil companies incentives to drill far offshore in deeper water where the risk is presumably higher. Now, <clears throat> This is an example of government with statutory types of regulation and tax law altering the incentive structure in such a way as to create more environmental damage, or at least create the potential for more environmental damage. Uh, and, and yet I have students who continually come to me with some sort of underlying assumption that whatever the government does to regulate with regard to the environment is going to improve the environment. In many, many cases, that is simply not so. So you have oil firms that are drilling farther offshore where accidents are more likely and where the uh, accidents that do occur are far more difficult to deal with. This is a map of um, offshore oil wells that uh, Novak included in his, uh, his article. And one thing that I saw on this that was a little strange, and some people have pointed this out, <clears throat> it seems to stop at the Florida border. I seriously doubt that the oil deposits stop at the Florida border. There's a ban. So by artificially restricting the access to these deposits in shallower water off west coast of Florida, we're encouraging firms to drill further out into deeper water where accidents are more likely and, again, more difficult to deal with. This is what happened from 1995 to 2003, according to the Energy Information Administration, also from the Novak article. There's a lot that's been written on this, but Novak's was a good summary. Over this period of time, 95 to 2003, there was something like a five times increase in the amount of oil that firms could pump royalty-free, that is, without having to pay the government, in deep water. So there was something like a 250% increase in the percentage of the oil coming from deep water regions of the Gulf, simply because the government has set things up. 
essentially charge lower prices for deep water drilling and higher prices for inshore drilling, looking at after-tax prices. There's a lot of problems here. Another article that you might want to consider is by um, William Shugart in Human Events, uh, July 2010. I believe that's posted on uh, Independent Institute website. And he mentions that there's a tragedy. The commons problem here, the ownership of the oil is under the auspices of the federal government, which occasionally auctions these things off. And they, uh, since the bureaucrats can't benefit personally from the decisions they make, unlike a private sector entrepreneur, they, they uh, have no incentive to consider the values of the alternatives that are given up whenever drilling is done. I mean, recreational uses, commercial fishing, exploiting other mineral resources, or simply maintaining a pristine ocean environment, none of that ever enters into their calculation, and so we would expect to see leases auctioned without much attention being paid to safety concerns in the process. There's also a federal cap on liability, another intervention that probably reduced the incentive that firms had to pay attention to safety problems. Well, I'm out of time. We'll have to leave these lovely issues for some other discussion. Uh, Cafe DDT, endangered species. Uh, talk to Jeff Tucker about his new chemical that he discovered that is great for your washing machines and your dishwashers and all these wonderful inventions that are being progressively rendered illegal by people who know far more about things than we do, I guess. All right, well, I will be happy to talk to you afterwards. I'm done.